Yeah. 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 Is everyone, you're ready there? Okay. Wait for a couple of people to shuffle in. Okay. All right, everyone, uh, let's get started. So, my name is Matthew Moseson. I work with Verantis. I help work on developing <coughs> Fuel. It's a system for deploying OpenStack. Uh, prior to Marantis, I worked for Red Hat. Turn the microphone on. It's not. It's only for recording. Yeah. Ah. Sorry, you will just have to speak and project. Okay. <laughs> so if I'm not speaking loud enough, just let me know. So prior to working at OpenStack, I was a desktop guy. So I worked on the internal variant of Red Hat uh, for people using them on laptops. Uh, it gave me a good experience doing deployment reliable installation from CD-based media uh, and NFS. Um, but OpenStack is a little more complicated than a laptop. It's just a rough sketch, you know, the interactions. There's so many pieces, you just can't put them on one screen. So the relationships between all the OpenStack components are, are really huge. So Glance is very key, um, and Keystone is very key. To boot in, to, to install an uh, a virtual machine, you need the image that it boots from. To store any objects, you need a store to store objects. So, Glance is very key to OpenStack, and so is Keystone for identity, because every request must be authenticated. But when you install OpenStack uh, on your own, uh, and you're trying to figure out which component is broken, you're going to follow the breadcrumbs probably back to Keystone and then back to your MySQL database. Um, and find that you have a closed port on your firewall to you know, some node. <clears throat> or your network cabling is wrong, and that's why you can't connect. So it's really easy to fail installing OpenStack. Um, so that was one uh, thing that really got me interested, is how, how easy is it to do it? I tried it on my own. I didn't get very far beyond one node. Um, but when I joined Marantis, uh, we had something like this. Uh, not quite so easy. Um, this is an older diagram, but it's still more or less correct. Um, there, there's controllers, um, usually three, in high availability uh, configuration, and they expose an internal and an external virtual IP for communication. Um, and all the OpenStack services run on all the coasts, uh, and some services which need to be in a special relationship are managed by pacemaker. Um, to do that and automate it requires some orchestration. So fuel had to get a lot more complicated um, to meet these challenges because Neutron, which used to be called Quantum, um, had to have a special um, configuration for its agents. And then, of course, doing a high Availability Galera uh, is interesting when you have failures and recoveries, the split brain, brain procedure. So we started with really small deployments, you know, installing virtual machines. Uh, I'm going to do a demo in VirtualBox, um, probably the most evil virtualization, but it works uh, on my laptop and I have a small amount of memory. But we also need a system that scales all the way up to 100 or more. Um, so there, you, there's a need for orchestration of deployment, this section, then the next, and then uh, fire, defend, sorry, all the control, the compute nodes, which are just hypervisors. They just check in, they're stateless, they have no uh, services that are highly available. Um, so, <coughs> We first tried to do deployment with Puppet, with the Puppet Master, and found that it just doesn't scale. It can't handle large deployments, 
concurrently on really small machines like my laptop. If my machine, if I tried to do an HA deployment with a Puppet Master with 10 virtual machines, even if I had enough memory, it would still run in memory in the Puppet database. And to make Puppet highly available, it's, it's also a way to, we just can't expect any user to want to set up three hosts just to do Puppet and do nothing else. They want OpenStack, they don't want overhead. So um, we had to get rid of it and it took a, lot, a while, so we had to come up with another way to distribute um, Puppet Manifest, Puppet Facts uh, to each host. Um, plus, certificate management was time consuming. You know, each system has to check in to Puppet, and Puppet Master needs to sign the certificate, and then the Puppet host calls again and says, hi, now give me my data. Um, we ran into some issues with concurrency, of course, if you try to run Puppet many times on many hosts, you might get um, just server re fail to respond, or couldn't understand requests, or some weird Nginx error saying too many connections. Um, also, we wanted to get rid of the Ma Puppet Master because of the high amount of failures. It just wasn't really working for us. And Puppet Master does generate reports, does you know, let you generate some statistics that are pretty useful uh, for some organizations. But really for us, we didn't really need them, so we didn't bother collecting them. Here's a normal error when you try to do Puppet at scale. Um, so we moved them up uh, master list. The one key element we need to make Masterless Puppet really work was great logging, because you can't tell if it failed or how it failed without good logging. So we use our syslog, unstructured, um, unfortunately, but it works for us. Um, and then we use a orchestration tool we call the Stoop, which wraps around M Collective. It's a tool built by Puppet Labs that was used for automating Puppet, more or less. Um, but it works because it's asynchronous. Uh, and then our syslog can be asynchronous. If the our syslog is, server is busy, uh, the clients will retry and eventually send their logs. So it kind of loosened the bottleneck a whole bunch. Um, there's a diagram of a pigeon here because I'm just trying to illustrate when you run Puppet without a master, you don't need, you can use any method of transport. So this pigeon could be carrying um, the data we need to each node, for example, and it would get there asynchronously, of course. Um, all we need to know when we run Puppet is what's our host name, and that gets set up when we add systems to an environment to be deployed. Uh, we generate host names uh, sequentially uh, right now. And when they boot up, they know their host name, they check in with our orchestration system, the AMQP, and they get their information and they start running Puppet. Um, so we use CentOS as the main platform for fuel. Uh, we have some others, I don't like to mention them. <laughs> But CentOS was a great choice to start because it's quite reliable, uh, it's easy to get, there's mirrors everywhere, and there's no hassle. <coughs> um, Yum is really great, and we use it extensively, um, plus its capabilities for mirroring um, sorry, repositories. Uh, and then minor release upgrades, you know, from 6.3 to 6.4, 6.4 to 6.5 is usually quite painless. Uh, except in our case where we had issues with rapidly changing libraries. Um, there were more security updates, but they really still broke our development process because some things were just dependent on things and small fixes led to failures in deployment. When there's <coughs> thousands of moving parts, it's hard to pin down what broke. So we had to freeze our dev cycle 
um, with packages, we really needed to limit how many ways we can break deployment and let it be us and not CentOS. So we started to freeze CentOS and freeze EPAL um, just to make sure we could have a stable dev environment. Um, and EPAL changes more rapidly, uh, much more rapidly, and newer versions of Python libraries came out almost daily. I understand there's lots of changes happening in OpenStack and other components, and there's needs for newer features really quick. You know, OpenStack has you know, hundreds of commits every single day, so there's likely chances that the Python dependencies will change here and there. Some new project that's not even incubated yet comes out, but it has dependencies. So that's going to happen, and we needed to keep this from causing problems. But we also needed to patch a lot of these packages or grab packages from other sources, write our own, or do something in between. So we decided, let's just repackage. Hold on, let me just stay on EPAL for a second. We decided to repackage all of EPAL. Just let's take it, repackage it, resign it. We trust our key and keep EPAL on our own. I know, it's crazy, but you know, CentOS can repackage Red Hat, we can repackage EPAL. It's really easy. It isn't hard. Um, and then, of course, we based on RDO for the CentOS distribution. Um, and we some cherry pick some commits from upstream to fix you know, bugs that occur out in our installations. And RDO was really never a great problem for us because when you pull RDO, there's really, really tiny granular changes. It's not going to cause uh, issues when you're installing. Um, very unlikely that between one release set there are going to be dependency breaks. So we really enjoyed uh, working with RDO. Um, so we decided to change the point of failure to be ourselves. If we package incorrectly, let's fix it ourselves. Let's try to take on some effort to actually move forward in our dev cycle to keep CentOS EPAL um, from breaking our deployments. We didn't repackage CentOS itself. We just copy it and, and re rebase every few weeks. Um, of course, we rely on GPG keys. We make sure we don't add any third-party packages. You know, my colleague over there would just you know pull a package from SUSE and say, oh yeah, install. <laughs> like, oh god, what happened? You know, and then it ends up breaking something else. So it's really good to trust your packages um, based on secure on um, signed keys. Uh, we know that opens us up to some security issues, but you know we do really eventually catch up. So it's not like we're too far behind. Um, again, we had to build lots of third-party packages. We deployed Valera and SAP and Pacemaker, a newer version that's in Red Hat. Um, so we really needed our own build environment. Um, and we had some of our own components, you know, our orchestration, our um, networking agent that uh, reports your, the system's current network um, settings. And we also have a tool that does network verification. Um, we can test <coughs> connectivity if switches are correctly set up between hosts. So uh, we started out with a large build environment in Koji. Um, and that was working really great. But we support another OS that I'm not going to mention. So we actually switched over to SUSE's open build system. It's not too far off from Koji, so we weren't too upset, but it's still Git-based and uh, still generates VM repositories in the way we need and signs packages. Um, so we call this all together with CentOS and repackaged OpenStack plus our own components. Mirantis OpenStack uh, has Savannah, which is a tool to do Hadoop on OpenStack, and Murano. Uh, it's a tool to do Windows on OpenStack, but they called it more of um, application automation in OpenStack because you can really do any sort of 
nonlinear uh, deployments with it, um, like a Microsoft SQL Server, uh, and then our own orchestration to do lifecycle management. Uh, fuel itself. Um, am I going too fast? Okay. Uh, fuel itself has a web interface. Um, it was probably the, the key part to making it adoptable. Um, it's written in. What's that? No, Fuel Web. It's What's that? I mean the. Pi. Pi Web. Pi Web. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's stateless. Um, it connects to an API, which is backed by a Postgres database. Um, we have our orchestrator. It's wrapped around the collective, so it's also written in Ruby. Uh, we're trying to limit how much Ruby we have because most OpenStack is Python-based. Um, and we're considering switching over to Heat from OpenStack. Uh, the library itself is sort of a fork of Puppet OpenStack. Um, and it's related Puppet projects you know, for Nova, Glance, Cinder, uh, Neutron, etc. Uh, we use Cobbler. Um, we're staying on Cobbler instead of Foreman just because the only benefit we would get from Foreman is um, the Puppet um, source of facts. And it would complicate our Ruby environment even more, so we're st staying, sticking with Cobbler <coughs> because it installs quite easily. And then we have our network verification I covered earlier. Um, it includes also a DHCP checker to make sure that there's only one DHCP server present on the network, or there's no DHCP server present on the network, which is really important before deployment because uh, the number of DHCP servers greatly influences your chances of being able to use virtual machines. Otherwise, they boot up and get some random data, and then you lose them. They just fall away. Um, and then we have a health check. Uh, the health check is um, somewhat of a modification of what Tempest does. And it's a framework for making sure when you install OpenStack that you can you know, log in, you can create users, delete users, rename them, boot instances, snapshot them, restore them. Um, it does a little more just to make sure that all the components work, plus our extra pack uh, components, uh, Savannah and Rano, also work. Um, and it has a benefit that you know, we have it pre-configured and it just works with default values and cleans up after itself. Um, here's a really interesting and impossible to read architecture uh, diagram of how Fuel uh, backend works. Um, the first step is you set up the master um, and it sets up a web UI, it sets up WebMQ, um, mCollective, Cobbler, etc. Once it's powered on, you can power on your uh, systems you intend to put in your OpenStack cluster. And they boot into what's something called Bootstrap. So Bootstrap is a CentOS-based image that loads in as a RAM disk. Um, it's really stripped down. There's no docs. There's no, um, very few uh, firmware data there. It's just Python, uh, Ruby, and um, our orchestration tools and network tools on there. So when you boot into Bootstrap, it checks back into Fuel and says, hi, I'm alive. Here's my disk. Here's my network and CPU and memory data. <coughs> and it gets added to the inventory of hosts. Um, and then our very simple user logs into the web UI, set, chooses his OS, um, which networking style, HA or non-HA, extra components to install, and then clicks on hosts, configures the disks, configures the networks, and hits deploy. Um, after that, these machines reboot. Cobbler set, um, sets up a profile for them to reboot, and <coughs> we deploy CentOS. We have a very crazy kickstart of some 630 lines to deploy. Um, they reboot. After installation, uh, pull down the information and start deploying OpenStack. So the question, why is so big kickstart if you just use Puppet? I mean, if Puppet is supposed to do a Networking and disks are really complicated, and you don't want Puppet to touch either of these. 
until you have something basic to start with. Uh, we have a really interesting situation where uh, interfaces get enumerated one, two, three, four in Bootstrap, and then you reboot and they become one, three, four, two. So um, we inventory them here and then reconfigure them at the end of um, post install just to make sure when you reboot, UDEV has them ordered the way we want and not the way Puppet wants or the system prefers itself to run. Um, the same happens with certain disk um, uh, vendor, disk mo sorry, kernel modules for disks. Um, the ordering sometimes changes, so we try to keep everything lined up in the same direction so there's no surprises. Uh, it's a lot of extra work, but it, it doesn't come back and the code seems to work. Um, and of course, these problems are multiplied when you install on three OSs. Uh, so, a little bit more about Puppet. When you're running Puppet with a Puppet Master, all you have to do is install the host, run DHCP so you have IP and, DH and uh, name server. Uh, if you don't have a network connection, you can't use Puppet. <coughs> Fun fact. It won't work at all. Uh, and then you run Puppet Agent, and then it tries to find what's Puppet Master for my domain, and submits the SSL certificate, and I have to go over the, the host and approve it. You know, normal. Uh, and then you run it again, Puppet sends catalog back, Puppet runs, and then the node sends back a report, and in our case that report's about 200 megabytes. So, certain issues, if you reinstall a host and it has the same host name, Puppet's going to reject it, so you have to go clear it and try again, and hope you typed it in the right order. And handling 200 megabyte files, storing them, it doesn't really scale, and Nginx doesn't love large uploads very much. So, that was just a huge problem to deal with. Uh, so, we decided to copy um, the Puppet data over to all the hosts with mCollective, uh, with RS2 wrapper, um, and just do really good logging. <coughs> um, also, when you're booting asynchronously, um, you don't want to run Puppet on the compute nodes before you do the controllers, and you have to do HA in a proper order, so that was another task we had to solve. And lastly, failing early. Um, so when Puppet fails, we need to report back to the master fuel node and say, stop everything. We have problems. Um, and then the, another piece that's really interesting is um, the whole config of fuel. It used to be just a really large Puppet site PP file, and you just type in there and pick, you know, I want this Ethernet zero on this host to match the management network and this one to be the public network. Now it's we have some automatic decisions being made, but still there's a few choices now you can do in the web interface. Uh, pick what extra components you want installed if you want debugging enabled. Um, you really need a lot of disk if you want debugging enabled. Um, if you're installing on small VMs with 30 gigs of disk, you probably can't do debugging. Uh, <clears throat> hypervisor type, just some simple options but they make a difference. You know, everyone needs these options to be available to them um, because there's obviously a big difference between a demo and virtual environment versus physical. Um, so uh, instead of having users type values in, we generate a YAML file that has all the right information uh, and it gets checked to make sure none of these settings are incompatible together. And we also generate unique passwords uh, on the back end instead of forcing the user to type password one, two, three, ten times on the same form. Um, when you use this system, you could use our um, the API or the command line tool of Fuel to go download these, um, this config, change it, and upload it back. But if you use the web UI, you just get random passwords and you can go look them up later. 
Again, the main object was to make this usable for the simple user. Um, if you were to look at the JSON file, the giant YAML, yeah, I know that makes sense. Um, it's just the JSON, what the text looks like in the web UI, what the value can be, and um, what fields there are that go in it for each parameter. <laughs> uh, it comes out as YAML in the end, and there's information. Every node knows about every other node. Um, all of its IP addresses, all of its host names, so that if it needs to get information about the next host, it can do it here instead of phoning back in and saying, give me a list. Instead, we just give the host all the data up front because um, we don't want to rely on a single point of failure. Um, and then when you go into the public code itself, we just use the parsing element function and feed in the file, and you can start um, evaluating and deploying. Um, many other systems that use Puppet will use Hira or PuppetDB to store this data. We actually wrote something that's pretty much a clone of Hira, but it seems to do what we need. It has all the flexibility we want. Um, so, I've just gone over a bit of the architecture of Fuel and how it works, uh, but I can give you guys a demo of how we deploy Fuel and how it looks. Uh, any questions before I start? Cool. So, you're going to forgive me for running Windows? <laughs> no? Okay. Uh, just give me your shame. So, oh, thank you, Windows. Um, so I have two virtual machines booted up in VirtualBox, uh, and I have a CentOS VM running. Um, they're not very complicated, they're just a gig of memory, uh, 264 gig disks. Uh, when they power on, um, they check in uh, over NQP and report their data. Hold on. Uh, see our default OS is CentOS. Uh, you can choose HA or non-HA. I don't have enough memory to run high availability. I need about 12 gigs of memory. Otherwise, I will get a blue screen. Um, we default to QEMU because most people who start using this do it as a demo. So I'm going to use QEMU. It's just full vert. Um, I can choose which networking <coughs> version to use. Uh, no, the network is the most simple, but it's uh, the most limited. And this is a really simple network, so no, the network is what we should use. Uh, by default, we can use LVM backend, or we can use Ceph backend. I'm just going to use the defaults here. Um, and Glance, the image store, uses a sharding based system uh, called Swift, built by Rackspace which is quite interesting. Uh, and I'm going to choose Savannah. It'll allow you to set up Hadoop. Um, it doesn't include any images for Hadoop, but it can, it's a framework to actually start using it to do high-performance computing on OpenStack. So I'm going to hit Add Nodes. It's full screen. Um, so we uh, break it up into only four roles, two types of storage, compute and, con and controller. <coughs> Um, many other installers for OpenStack make you pick each component individually and choose that component, set it up, and then move on and kind of do a 20-step process. We really just combine them into a, consolidate into one role. The controller does the database, the identity, the image store, the block store, uh, and the main Nova API and networking. And the dashboard, of course. Um, I'll show you this is just what it looks like. Um, we identify the, the manufacturer. There's you know, Dell, HP, IBM, et cetera, KDM. Why is getting 128 if you put in, in VirtualBox 64? 264 gig. Ah, to the right, okay. Yeah. 
And so there's just there's some profile information. I mean, this is all simple data. Um, we actually use not puppets factor, but chefs ohai, just because it was easier to interact and parse um, from our original develops. <coughs> um, and of course, um, <coughs> by default, we use two NICs, but most people end up using three. Uh, there's the admin network for actual provisioning and management with the fuel parts. <coughs> then there's the actual management network, which is you know, database and internal API and internal storage traffic. Uh, and then the public is what the virtual machines end up using. Um, this is the part that most people can't get right because you have to actually cable your switches together correctly. Um, so I'll show you in a second. Uh, we have the network check. I'll just add the compute node. <coughs> I'll go back to networking. Since I'm using flat DHCP, um, everything is uh, really simple. We just pick up some uh, predefined uh, VLANs to use for each of the networks. The management network is on VLAN 101, storage is on 102, and VM internal traffic is on 103. <coughs> and we just use Google's public DNS by default. They're not going to work here, and my tests are going to fail because <coughs> Wi-Fi is not working for my laptop. Uh, what this does is it takes the two machines that are loaded into the bootstrap mode right now. I'll show you that, actually. They're running a DHCP check, and they're trying to ping each other on each of the VLANs. And it shows that it works. There's all sorts of interesting uh, information that shows if it doesn't work, like the MAC address that matches this MAC can't ping uh, the other host. But yeah, it sends tagged UDP frames out. <clears throat> and of course, this is CentOS. Okay. So, again, here we have some extra configs, just really basic options to make it not too difficult to, to choose. What do you want to install? Do you want debugging? Which hypervisor type? We'll let you ch check again. Um, there's an option to provision floating IPs, it's the public IP address of your machine, when you, the virtual machines after you provision them. These are just common options that most uh, user guides say you should choose this yourself, not just skip it. Um, we can forward syslog to another host if you prefer to centralize your logs even more. We centralize them on the main node right now. And there's some options for Ceph if you let me start the deployment and I'll show you what I mean by 630 line um, kickstart. Boot is Bootstrap. By the, um, by the way, the way we manage it is just by Pixie Boot. We don't do IPMI because it's not available anywhere, um, but we have plans to. Um, um, we do have paranoia that the machine might boot uh, on the Pixie network from another interface, so we do configure all of them, all the interfaces for the admin network, just in case. Um, and we do provide some extra data for the host that gets added here. So there's all sorts of uncollected data. But all of the disk information is included here.
I know, I know you guys love to look at WordPad, but we have a very complicated JSON format for specifying all the disk um, <coughs> parameters. I'll show you, the, I didn't show you the disk. Let me just go back to that. So by default, we default to about 17 gigs for the base, and then we kind of split like 40, 60 image store. Oh, oh we don't have um, a Swift partition here. I think it just goes into base by default. Um, if you end up with uh, Cinder in HA, um, it, pick, it picks up 60% of the disk here. There's more options. I can't change it now that I've already started deploying. Um, but there's, you know, some checks and some uh, flexibility for how you partition. Um, I'll show you the kickstart. Um, so the usual, really, really normal options like which repository to install from language, time zone. Uh, maybe I can make this bigger. Um, uh, but then we have our own um, partitioning uh, pre-scripts and network scripts. And we have our own script that uses this quick Python script to forward, um, send stuff, data to syslog. So there's some items that happen in Anaconda that don't go to syslog by default. Um, like our post scripts, usually they just get put in the root directory and not over a syslog. Um, actually, I can show you our logs. So, other servers. <coughs> I can't see all of it because of the resolution. But we do. Um, log all the messages that come through, and we do break it up into you know each component, storage, you know what happens with M Collective uh, when it was before it was installing, and when it's after I'm done installing, we'll have Puppet logs, we'll have Nova logs, Cinder logs, all the different components, um, and we can filter on log level. Um, so we do have some level of structure to the, which, which component's going. It's not like everything's going to all our messages. So we're still installing. Let's go back to the Kickstart. So we do match each MAC address um, that gets past the kernel option and reassign them into the network config by hand and parse the JSON and generate really complicated partitioning scheme. Specify packages to install. Um, we have to install Puppet and some Ruby libraries before running Puppet, so most packages do get installed with Puppet. It works really well. So if we were to install Red Hat, uh, Origin Setup would fail, but you need Origin Setup if you're going to install Red Hat. So we just leave it in there and it ignores missing. And it's good enough for me. Uh, we just say, well, Massive Fastest Mirror Plugin, for example, <coughs> just a little bit of optimization so, so that... Why do you keep Origin Setups? Huh? Why do you keep... We also it never existed in the chain I'm aware. We can also install in Red Hat, but we it, it, we use the same Kickstart for both. And then we have some nice voodoo with a lot of our um, network tools are actually just Ruby gems that are not packaged correctly into the RPMs. So we just pull down. Uh, I just want to show a more interesting piece. Where did you get the gems from? Um, so when you install fuel from an ISO, um, it includes a few directories of um, Puppet 
and um, Ruby libraries that are just there in tireballs, um, and it stores them on a web server. I know, it's really interesting. And they get installed in virtual ends, so that's why they're not packaged in uh, RPMs right now. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, and here's the evil script that does um, after next boot, we configure UDEV to uh, keep the same order as we used when it was in bootstrap mode. <laughs> so, go back. They should be done in a second. Um, do you guys have any more questions while we're waiting on it? Yeah. Um, one of the tools to install, another kind of uh, to install this is with Backstack. Yes. But, but the problem with Backstack is that the SSL layer is not implemented. Uh, does this implement the SSL connection between the nodes? I don't believe we have it yet. Do you mean open, inside OpenStack? Or between like AMTB? When, when you install with Backstack, yeah. uh, it's not production ready because the, the, it's not a secure connection between the nodes. Yeah. Between only OpenStack nodes or OpenStack node and Pocket node? No, no, the nodes, for example, the... Like Nova API traffic is not SSL. As far as I know, they implement traffic encryption for some sort of lines, but it's not in the upstream folder. But it will be. Sir? It will be. Yeah. If I understand right, you are using RDO. It's a uh, but um, not the um, foreman. It's the foreman you are using um, a cobbler. Yes. That's the main difference between Miranda School and uh, Red Hat of the spec lab. RDO doesn't include foreman. It's just it's a, it's a it's a method and to I, do I, deployment. Uh, RDO includes a um, lightweight version of foreman. And Red Hat OpenStack platform is has the I, right oh, version they of Foreman. So that, yeah. I believe yeah. both Foreman and you use Cobbler for the Foreman. Foreman is, is is a rewrite of Cobbler's functionality, something between Red Hat, Satellite, Spacewalk, and Cobbler, something in between. It was like a next generation evolution of of what Cobbler and and Spacewalk can do. Um, but it's written in Ruby and it requires a new version of Ruby. And our Ruby is already very complicated um, in our environment, so we haven't moved to, to Foreman at this point. But I know, for example, CERN uses it um, with some success. Are there any plans to make it, um, to provide the, uh, with the Ansible instead of uh, to pro mm -hmm. Well, we're moving to a pluggable architecture, so between there'll be more stages between where if a third party wants to, they can add a plugin and and you know have it use any config management, for example, a bash script or Ansible or Salt, for example. Sorry, but we're seeing the script once more. Uh, are you uh, pending fixing the network? Interface order. Oh, the network interface order. Oh, the screen keeps the cobbler bit. Oh, yeah. This is not the part, it is, this is above. Oh, above. No, it was the one below. I know it's <laughs> like the, the one I'm missing, and you are read. <coughs> not this one? Uh, yes, that, that's the one. And now I see where the output goes. It goes to uh, network scripts interface called config. Mm -hmm. Part of it does, and part of it goes. Um, okay, it's back. Uh, I got it. Thank you. Um, 
Oh, sorry. We have part of it go to um, Etsy UDEV rules persistent net. So part of it goes to uh, if config scripts, and some of it goes to UDEV. Thank you. It's just, yeah, surprises are not really fun when it verified in Bootstrap and then you reinstall and it shows differently. So we had to do this. <laughs> I think I'm having a bit of a Windows bug where it doesn't want to finish installing. Shoot. I'm sorry, this usually doesn't happen. I did it four <laughs> times. Uh, Only the audience. Mr. Murphy at the table. Well, they didn't make them do the needy sacrifice, but uh, that would work. Yeah, that would be a great idea. Well, I can show you the health check. It's quite similar to what you can do in Tempest. It just does a lot of requests and tries to create lots of objects and then delete them later. Um, and if it fails, we have some steps that it shows if you want to test it again manually on the command line, how you can reproduce it, and where to look for logs. In case this didn't work, I had another piece of my presentation that might be interesting. After the bear is uh, Puppet OpenStack. Um, who here has heard of Puppet OpenStack project? Um, so I know CERN uses it, Univance, iWeb, Red Hat, and us. Um, so it was sponsored by Puppet Labs, they kind of gave it a space for incubation, but then it became part of StackForge, which is the collection of unofficial projects of OpenStack that may eventually become <coughs> official. Um, it's Apache licensed, it has a very active community. Um, they install on CentOS, Fedora, Ubuntu, Debian, uh, that's it. Obviously there's no you know, free BSD support because OpenStack only runs on Linux. Uh, what's interesting is they try to follow the OpenStack contribution model with Garrett and Karma and voting up and down um, and gating where an automatic test can actually um, block approval of any um, proposed changes. Um, if you're interested in looking at Puppet OpenStack, you'd have to sign the contributor agreement. Um, OpenStack.org that would apply for any component. Um, a good place to start is to look on Launchpad, uh, an interesting platform for bugs. And um, each public project has its own space um, and it's a separate tracker for bugs and a separate Git repo. So there's Nova, Compute, Gl uh, Nova, Glance, Ceph, Neutron, Cinder, and Keystone and Horizon. Um, they're also is always looking for people to review requests. There's tons of patches out there, but not everyone has time to test them. Uh, when you're running Puppet, and it could take up to an hour to run, uh, you know, time to reproduce things is quite limited among the core reviewers, so feel free to go check out changes and try to deploy and see if it works. Um, a lot of work is necessary. Um, some things come out that are tested but they don't make it, but Puppet Code was written to support them and needs to be cleaned up later. That happens a lot, actually. Um, and then if a new feature comes out, like these projects that are being <coughs> tested, like Taskflow and Solemn and 
some others. Uh, well, Triple O, of course, is, is incubated as well. So there needs to be new pilot modules to support them. Well, Triple O is quite different, so it has its own requirements. Uh, wow, that's a dumb, dumb one. Um, if you want to learn more about fuel, there's uh, fuel.moractus.com. Uh, the code is free, you can view it on Stackforge. Um, if you want to download the ISO, it's free, but you just need to sub submit an email address. You don't have to pay, you don't have to tell us your name, just an email. Um, uh, we have a wiki for how to contribute to fuel. Um, we take patches from the community all the time now. Um, some people are working on Logstash, I believe, and we had a Chinese team translate our user interface into Chinese, and that's now in our uh, release code. And Pop It Open Stack has its own um, info page there. Um, let me see, did this actually deploy? No, really. It's a shame. I swear. Um, it works. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to use the CLI for food? Yes. To deploy so it without the nice food? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So the most common scenario would be if you wanted to create a reproducible interface. So for example, you one time went here, clicked all the buttons, set the settings you want, and then you can do fuel dash dash and the environment number, uh, and then download settings. So you can download it as a YAML format, make changes, or just keep it. And then, and then you can just upload it again. So you have to create the environment and then upload the settings. Uh, you can granularly change every option, or you can download the whole settings and re-upload it. Um, there's a disclaimer, there's no syntax checking. It just tries to run it and works with it. Thank Fuel is software to deploy OpenStack, and but what is needed to deploy Fuel itself? Is it just uh, one machine or? Um, <laughs> so, so to deploy Fuel, if you didn't have the ISO already, here is a really long um, tree of make scripts <coughs> to actually generate an image. Um, so it pulls in data from software repositories. Um, we have a public one available um, that you can download from. We have our own, but um, it assembles uh, all the packages you need. Uh, the Ruby and Python requirements, builds the bootstrap image with a fresh um, SSH key, uh, and packages it into an ISO, which you can just go take physically. Uh, we also generate an image file, which you could DD to a flash disk as well, and use that as install media. Um, so did I answer your question? But there is no package. Um Installation for food. So yum install food. Yeah, it's it's part of something we're working on because we have a custom Ruby environment to to do the actual backend for fuel, and we have to set up uh, Rabbit and Q and M Collective in the Postgres database. All of these steps are are usually granular, and it's actually deployed via Puppet scripts as well. So it's, it's not like a one command, you can't just yum yeah, install cobbler, service start cobbler, it's, it's a little more advanced. But not saying that but it's simple, it's, it's, it's a lot of images. What you, what you have for download, yes. you have pre installed all the components together on this image, right? They're not pre installed, they get installed sequentially, pop it runs, and configures. During the, the boot up uh, step. Yeah. They will be installed. Yes. <laughs> um, during the installation of Fuel, there's a console-based menu that gets run um, and lets you configure your network because that is another piece that can break and people need flexibility.
Okay. Does it feel set up? And you can configure your network interfaces. I know it looks kind of yes. 1980s, but it does just enough, and it does check to make sure there's no other DHCP server on the network where your Pixie is running. And you configure your static and dynamic ranges where your DNS server is. You can reset your root password, set your MTP up. And the whole thing is open source, or? Yeah. It means we can, someone can build the whole image by himself. Yeah, and we have a document. <laughs> but on for our, on production our... use, you can use it on 10 servers and behind 10 servers. Yeah. <laughs> is, is that important now? I, thought, I know we, we, we proposed uh, like, a lim like a limited use for free users. Yes, it is. Okay. I'm sorry. I don't. <coughs> Why not sales first? I just built it. I don't. I don't market it. <laughs> Would it allow you to deploy uh, like a single node, only one? We have some small. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so DevStack does that. So just use DevStack. Um, there's no um, practical case where you would want it all in one and actually pay a vendor money. And DevStack does just fine for what, what you would want out of an all-in-one. But we do have some, just some public works that we, we could do it in theory. It's just not something our customers need. Yeah, just for me, I'm also from Iran, but if you have a 16 gigabyte machine, it's perfectly to see how it works with high availability with all the tools in it. With 8 gigabyte you can deploy it, install it, see how it works, but if you have a 16 gigabyte machine, sometimes even a laptop, it works perfectly on, uh, on Linux or on OS X. And uh, the nice thing about it is it is also the log collection you can get from it and the pre -checked. And it's just nicer to download and to start up in a virtual machine. Basically, we have a couple servers of Packerspace, so it would be nice to deploy OpenStack there, but not necessarily on many nodes. Yeah, just do it. Okay. And uh, the nice thing is, uh, you, 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 the first 30 days of support are free, and if you deploy on less than 10 nodes, uh, you can leave it installed. So. And it's uh, also support is based on subscription based per node. Yes. Okay. Uh, is there a last question? Yeah. And I'm sorry for the failed demo. That's really um, awesome. I give you a microphone. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.